Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for part three, the final part of RSET's Invasive Species Monitoring with Remote Sensing Training Series. My name is Sativa Cruz, and I'm your host for today's webinar. I'm an applied scientist with the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute based at NASA Ames Research Center and a trainer with the Ecological Conservation Team. Today, we will cover mapping of invasive grassland species with hyperspectral remote sensing led by our guest, Hamed Galizade who is an associate professor at Oklahoma State University. We are thrilled to have him join us. Since this is an introductory series, there aren't many prerequisites. However, we do recommend you watch the webinar, Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, prior to taking this training. This can give you a refresher of basic remote sensing principles. We also encourage you to review parts one and two of this webinar if you weren't in for those sessions. To receive a certificate of completion, participants must complete the homework. It's gonna to open today, August 28th, and will close on September 11th. Everything will be posted on the training webpage. Our team has set the following overall objectives for the training. By the end of this training, attendees will be able to recognize the extent and impact of invasive species, as well, as well as identify the types of remote sensing data and products that can be used for invasive species and monitoring. We also explored some key considerations, benefits, and limitations of remote sensing data sets. In part two, we covered remote sensing methods used to monitor aquatic invasive species. And in this final piece of the series, we will cover grassland invasive plant species. If you have any questions, please put your questions in the questions box. It's gonna be at the bottom right. There are three dots and you can click that and type in your question to the Q&A box. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all of the questions during our Q&A session after the webinar. Any questions that we're unable to answer during our time together will be answered in the Q&A document and posted to the training website, usually about a week after the training. And with that, I am pleased to hand over the mic to Hamer Golizadeh and return at the end of this section to close us out. Take it away, Hamer. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Sativa. Um, uh, my name is Hamad Golizadeh. I am an associate professor in the Department of Geography at Oklahoma State University. And today I want to talk to you about the application of remote sensing to map an invasive plant in grassland um, ecosystems. So here's the, um, here are the objectives of this talk. Hopefully by the end of this uh, talk, uh, we'll be able to describe the key challenges of monitoring invasive plants in grassland ecosystems using field-based techniques, outline the key benefits of remote sensing techniques uh, for mapping invasive plants compared to field-based techniques, describe the applications of airborne hyperspectral data for uh, mapping invasive plants in grasslands, and finally identify limitations of remote sensing for mapping invasive plants. So here's the outline of this talk. First, um, I'm gonna uh, provide a brief background on remote sensing of invasive plants. Then I'm gonna present to you a case study that we did um, a few years ago, um, and we used hyperspectral remote sensing to map an invasive plant in grasslands. And finally, um, at the end of this talk, I'm gonna uh, talk about data availability considerations for mapping invasive plants using uh, remote sensing. So remote sensing of invasive plants is not um, new. Um, in fact, it is um, a few decades um, old. Uh, one of the first studies uh, that used remote sensing technology to uh, map invasive plants was done in 1975, where um, researchers used um, um, airborne um, color photography, color infrared photography, uh, to detect an invasive plant called a water hyacinth. This is an aquatic um, invasive uh, plant. So remote sensing of invasive plants is um, not um, new, but since then, since 1975, there has been a lot of progress on remote sensing technology, 
on the methods we use to map invasive plants. And now um, remote sensing of invasive plants is becoming more and more um, common. What, what, what makes remote sensing a viable approach uh, to monitor invasive plants? Well, there are um, many reasons, uh, but the primary reason is that remote sensing can help us um, uh, collect data uh, across large spatial domains um, over time with consistent um, format, uh, which is a great advantage compared to field-based uh, techniques. Um, if you want to um, collect um, uh, data on invasive plants based on uh, field techniques, we need to go uh, to the field. We need to visit a large number of points um, and document the status of invasive plants. Uh, but unfortunately, these field-based techniques are um, costly, are really time-consuming, and we often do them um, a few number of times. We cannot repeat them, again, because of this um, high cost of field-based uh, techniques. So remote sensing has a lot of uh, potential uh, to monitor invasive uh, plants. Another important question we need to answer before um, conducting a study on uh, remote sensing of invasive plants is, um, how can remote sensing help us monitor invasive plants? So there are um, a few tasks where remote sensing can help us uh, to monitor invasive uh, plants. The first task is mapping the presence of invasive plants. Uh, some people call this direct mapping of invasive plants. Um, we basically use remote sensing and map uh, where um, invasive plants are present. Another task remote sensing can help us um, um, in the context of monitoring invasive plants is providing useful data for predicting the distribution of invasive plants. Um, some uh, people refer to this as indirect mapping. A great example of this is spatial distribution modeling, where we used uh, remotely sensed data along with other environmental data uh, to understand and identify areas that are prone to, to future um, invasion. And another task remote testing can help us with is assessing the impact of invasive plants. For example, understanding the impact of invasive plants on ecosystem functioning, for example, um, primary productivity. So each of these tasks, um, you know, we can spend hours um, and, and discuss them. Uh, and because of that, um, for today's talk, I'm just going to focus on the first task, uh, mapping the presence of um, invasive uh, plants. Although remote sensing has a lot of potential um, to uh, map invasive plants, it is not necessarily simple. It is not uh, necessarily uh, straight um, forward. Um, here is one example, a hypothetical conversation that could happen between um, a remote sensing scientist and an application partner. So there is this remote sensing scientist. They have uh, a lot of remotely sensed data. They are interested in uh, studying invasive plants and they approach uh, their application partner, for example, a landowner, a manager, an ecologist, and tell them, hey, I have a lot of remotely sensed data. Are you interested in studying invasive plants? And the application partner responds, yes, of course. Um, can you help me uh, detect individual cheatgrass plants in my um, in my land. So cheatgrass is a name of an invasive plant um, in some regions in the U.S. And the remote sensing scientist responds, I would love to, but these plants are too small uh, to detect remotely. And then uh, the application partner responds, oh, so you mean uh, we cannot uh, use remote sensing to uh, study invasive plants. Now, when it comes to mapping invasive plants um, using remote sensing, Often the expectation is um, that we can use remote sensing to detect and map every individual species. But it is um, rarely the case, uh, especially in ecosystems like grasslands where we are dealing with really small plants. Um, detecting and identifying individual plants is difficult, if not impossible. And this begs the question, um, how can we um, effectively um, use remote sensing to map invasive plants in grasslands? And there are a few ways. One of the easiest way, uh, ways to effectively map 
invasive plants in grassland ecosystems is by taking advantage of the contrasting phenology of invasive, invasive plants compared to native plants. So phenology, um, we can simply define it as the life cycle events of uh, plants. For example, when they green up, when they um, senesce. So if you can um, find a time window where, uh, for example, an invasive species is green and uh, native plants are not green and collect our remotely sensed data during that time period, uh, the odds of success in mapping invasive plants uh, will be higher. Now, the important point here is that this phenology changes a lot from year to year because of uh, many factors like temperature or precipitation. So in order to identify this time window, we need to have access to remotely sensed data with fine temporal resolution. In other words, we need to um, collect remotely sensed data frequently. Here is one example. On the left side, you're looking at a native plant community. On the right side, you're looking at an invasive uh, plant community. So both of these uh, communities are from the same site. They are only um, a mile or two apart. And um, they have um, these pictures were taken um, only a couple of days apart. But as you can see, the native plant community is uh, completely senesced. Uh, but the uh, invasive plant community is photosynthetically active and very green. So if we can identify this time window and collect our remotely sensed data during this time window, um, then identifying and mapping the invasive plants will be way easier. But as I said, the tricky point here is that this optimal time window can uh, vary from year to year. Another way um, we can detect invasive plants um, remotely is when invasive plants um, have different um, characteristics, different functional traits compared to invasive plants. So I use the term functional traits. Uh, functional traits are simply um, attributes um, expressed by an individual in their environment. For example, uh, nitrogen content, plant height, seed mass. Uh, these are examples of um, functional traits. Now, something really interesting is that these functional traits um, can affect how we see uh, plants uh, from above. In other words, um, plant functional traits affect remote sensing signals. And um, if we want to follow this approach, this trait-based approach to detect invasive plants, we need to have access to remotely sensed data with fine uh, spectral resolution. I will talk about this uh, more in the coming slides, but this trait-based approach is another way we can map invasive plants. And here is an example. You're looking at two plant um, um, uh, communities. The one on the left is a native plant community. The one on the right is an invasive plant community. And you can clearly um, see that visually these two communities are very different. Um, that the plant heights are very different. Uh, that the leaf angle, um, uh, the leaf, even the leaf colors are very different, which might indicate that uh, one of these uh, species might have um, higher pigment content compared to, to an another uh, plant community. So all these functional traits together affect how we see um, these plants um, remotely from above. Uh, something really important is that I want to mention here is that the success of a phenology-based or trait-based approaches depends on the prevalence of invasive plants in the study area. But what does it mean? Um, here is one example. If you are dealing with large and homogeneous patches of invasive plants, like the one you see on the left side, um, it is uh, easier to um, see this from above, and it is easier to map this uh, from above using remotely sensed data. Whereas if you are dealing with uh, small and sparse patches of invasive plants, like the one you see on the right side, it will be uh, more difficult. Um, to detect uh, it uh, from remotely sensed data. And as a result of that, when we are doing remote sensing uh, studies of um, invasive uh, species, it is ideal to have access to remotely sensed data with fine spatial resolution or fine uh, grain size or pixel size. It will um, increase the success of our mapping efforts.
Now that we have enough um, background knowledge on remote sensing of invasive plants, I want to talk about the main focus of uh, this presentation, uh, which is hyperspectral remote sensing. This is a specific type of remote sensing where we can collect um, remotely sensed data with fine um, or high uh, spectral um, detail. Uh, some people call this also imaging spectroscopy, so they, they both refer to the same thing. Uh, so we can um, put our hyperspectral sensors on a platform, for example, a satellite um, or an aircraft or a drone, and then collect um, remotely sensed data with fine spectral resolution, and then use these data to uh, detect or map invasive plants. But before um, doing a deep dive on remote sensing of invasive plants using hyperspectral data, I want to take a minute or two to briefly talk about um, optical remote sensing of plants. So we have sun as a source of energy or electromagnetic radiation. Uh, this electromagnetic radiation uh, strikes the target, in this case, um, our plant communities. Then some interactions will happen between electromagnetic radiation and uh, the target, and a portion of this energy is reflected back. Then our sensors on satellites or aircraft or drones can collect this information. And then at the end, we will have a spectral um, signature like this, like the one you see on the right side. Uh, some people call this reflectance. Some people call this a spectral profile or a spectral curve. But what you see in this graph on the y-axis is something we call reflectance. This is uh, the proportion of energy that is reflected back from the surface. And it is often uh, reported in percentage from 0% to 100% or as a ratio between 0 to 1. And what you see on the x-axis is uh, different regions of the spectrum, uh, visible, near-infrared, short period infrared. And something really interesting about this spectral profile is that it can give us a lot of useful information about plants. Uh, for example, it can um, give us information about water content of uh, a plant or its structure or its pigment content. So if we can um, build a sensor that can capture this information with high level of detail, meaning many narrow bands um, on the x-axis, we will have a hyperspectral instrument. So this is different from multi-spectral remote sensing where we have only a limited number of uh, spectral bands. Now, um, I'm going to uh, present to you our case study um, where we use um, hyperspectral remote sensing to map an invasive plant uh, in grassland ecosystems. And the name of this plant is Lespedes acuniata. Its scientific name um, is Lespedes acuniata. It also has some common names, uh, for example, Sericea or um, Chinese bush clover. To give you an idea how this plant looks like, I'm going to show you a very short video that we shot a few years ago. And in this video, you can see how this plant looks like in real world. So here is one example, that tall dense uh, stand that you see. Uh, it is Lespedisa cuniata. And here is another one right in front of you at the bottom left of uh, this slide. Another example of Lespedisa cuniata. So this um, invasive plant um, has become a major problem in several states in the U.S. The phrases you see on this slide, the top nightmare plant, greedy grass, finish, these are um, um, how these are phrases the landowners use to uh, describe this um, invasive uh, plant. And in fact, in some cases, um, uh, this uh, invasive plant have become um, the landowner's um, biggest land management cost. They need to spend a lot of effort and energy uh, to control or slow down the spread of this um, invasive uh, plants. And as a result of that, a lot of landowners um, have expressed the, uh, the need uh, to have a cost-effective approach to map the presence of this invasive plant in grasslands ecosystem, ecosystems. 
So if you are interested um, to learn about the distribution of this invasive plant um, in the US, you can go to this website at the bottom of this slide, um, EdMaps, and type the name of uh, invasive plant or any invasive species that you are interested in, and you can make a simple map. In this map, what you're looking at is uh, basically um, the distribution of uh, this invasive plant, the counties where this invasive plant has been observed. Um, in total, about um, 20 states have been affected by this invasive plant, and it is a major problem in several states like Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. So like any other invasive species, uh, this invasive plant uh, also has some interesting uh, background stories. Uh, this plant uh, was brought to the U.S. in the 1890s as a cheap forage to feed cattle. It was also brought here to control for soil um, erosion. But the question you might be asking is that, what makes Lespedeza cuniata um, invasive? In order to answer this question, we need to go through uh, the characteristics of uh, this uh, plant. Uh, this plant is a prolific seed producer. Uh, some um, research has shown that each stem of this plant can produce up to 1,000 seeds and they can stay active in soil for up to 20 years. It can also tolerate drought, Lespedeza cuneata also reproduces under poor soil conditions. For example, if you have acidic soil, uh, this uh, invasive species um, can probably survive. It is also a nitrogen fixing legume, and it has an average higher nitrogen content than many native uh, grassland species, which means that it is more nutritious. It is also taller than uh, many native plants, and you can see um, an example of this at the bottom of the slide inside that white dashed rectangle. That is a Lespedeza cuneata, and you can clearly see that it is uh, much taller than native plants. It means that it can outcompete native plants for light and replace them. And probably one of the most interesting characteristics of uh, Lespedeza cuneata is that it has high concentrations of phenolics, uh, specifically condensed tannins. So uh, tannins are um, chemical compounds, they are defense mechanisms, and um, grazing animals don't like um, uh, condensed tannins, it makes them sick. So when Ceresia or Lespedeza cuneata is mature, many grazing animals will avoid it because of high concentrations of um, uh, condensed tannins. So when you look at the list of these characteristics, it makes sense why this uh, plant was brought to the U.S. and why um, it is now uh, a major uh, problem. So a few years ago, um, we were really interested in using remote sensing to study this invasive plant. We wanted to use remote sensing to um, map uh, Lespedeza cuneata across large spatial domains. But it was not as easy as uh, we thought. We had um, a few challenges that we uh, needed to think about. The biggest challenge we had, we call it spatial uh, scale mismatch. But what does it mean? Um, if you look at uh, Lespedeza cuneata individuals, they are relatively small um, compared to the pixel size of commonly used remotely sensed data like Landsat. Even if you have um, tall, uh, large, and homogeneous patches of Lespedeza cuneata, um, many of them are still very difficult to map remotely, again, because the size of these uh, patches are smaller than the pixel size of remotely sensed data like Landsat. For example, Landsat 8 and 9, they have uh, spatial resolution or pixel size of 30 meters, which means that every pixel uh, covers an area of 30 meters by 30 meters. And it, it indicates that detecting um, Lespedeza cuneata patches that are smaller than this size, it, it can be very challenging. So that's, that was our first challenge. The other challenge we had was a uh, limited temporal resolution of remotely sensed data. So initially we were interested in using uh, a phenology based approach to map this invasive plant because uh, after talking with landowners, we learned that this uh, invasive plant usually greens up a few weeks before native plants and dies, senesces a few weeks after native plants. But the problem was that this time window, the timing of this uh, green up or senescence will vary a lot from year to um, year. 
And in order to find that optimal time window, we needed a remotely sensed data with fine temporal resolution, but we didn't have that type of data. So how did we overcome these um, challenges? After um, thinking about um, these challenges, uh, we realized that um, the easiest approach, the best approach, and uh, the most effective approach to map La Spiriza Cuniara is um, through collecting our own data from an airplane. So what we did, um, we used um, um, an aircraft and collected fine resolution remotely sensed data. In this case, the spatial resolution or pixel size of remotely sensed data was um, one meter. We also collected hyperspectral data, which means that we collected data with fine spectral resolution from an airplane. So at the end, we had data with fine spectral and spatial resolution, which is a great data set uh, for mapping invasive plants. But what was the idea behind um, our project. So if you remember a few slides ago, I talked about um, functional traits and the fact that they can affect remote sensing signals and how they look like. So the, the key hypothesis behind uh, this project was that uh, Lispiriza cuniata has a specific um, remotely observable functional traits uh, that can be used to distinguish it from other native plants in the um, uh, remotely sensed data. So if you um, notice, I use the term remotely observable functional traits. And the reason is that uh, not all functional traits are remotely observable. We cannot estimate all traits remotely. Uh, we can, for example, estimate pigment content remotely, but um, estimating seed mass directly uh, using remotely sensed data is not um, um, straightforward, if not impossible. So that's why I used uh, remotely observable functional traits um, in this slide. So um, the approach um, we developed uh, was a relatively straightforward approach. It has it had uh, two steps. In the first step, uh, we identified remotely observable functional traits uh, that can distinguish Lespiriza cuniata from native plants. And in the second steps, we used these traits to develop a remote sensing approach to map uh, Lespiriza cuniata. So two steps. Um, relatively straightforward. So to address um, and achieve the first uh, objective, the first uh, step of our analysis, we went uh, to the field, we went um, to uh, a grasslands and, and collect a lot of leaf samples. We harvest a lot of leaf samples and we send them to the lab to quantify a long list of vegetation functional traits, the ones that um, you can see um, on the table. And then we did um, some statistical analysis to identify which of these traits help us distinguish Lespiriza cuniata from native uh, species? And at the end, uh, we identified six traits, total nitrogen, chlorophyll content, uh, carotenoids, uh, potassium, magnesium, and cannabinoid. These are the traits um, that um, we thought uh, are useful um, to the, for distinguishing Lespiriza cuniata from native plants. Now, our second step. The second step of this um, uh, analysis was our remote sensing um, aspect of the project. Um, so something really interesting uh, about remote sensing is that we can use remotely sensed data, remote sensing uh, spectral information uh, to estimate um, some important functional traits. So for example, um, we use a data-driven data model called PLSR, partial least squares, and estimated these um, six um, functional traits that we identified in uh, step one. And the process is simple. Um, in these data-driven models, the input variables are our spectral information, our, and our, amp, uh, our amp output is um, uh, the plant functional trait that we are interested in. So in this slide, you're looking at nitrogen content. So we ran our model, uh, we, we calibrated the model, we ran the model, and when we were happy with the performance of the model, uh, we applied this model to every single pixel in our remotely sensed data. And the outcome of this uh, process is a contiguous layer raster of planned functional traits. So you're looking at nitrogen content here. 
And here's another example. This is a, a raster layer of nitrogen content in a uh, part of our study area. Red pixels are pixels with high nitrogen content, and blue pixels are uh, pixels with low nitrogen content. So we did the same thing for um, our other uh, functional traits as well. And after doing um, all of this, uh, we used um, uh, the, the layers of functional traits to uh, map to detect um, Lespiriza cuniara presence. In order to do this, we used something called uh, classification. So classification is a very common approach to use in remote sense data. And what happens in classification, uh, we basically um, give the input data to the classifier, uh, we train the classifier, and then the classifier labels the pixels for us. In this case, the labels were uh, Lespiriza cuniata present, Lespiriza cuniata absent. And then repeated this um, uh, classification hundreds of times, and we came up with a probability uh, map, which shows the probability of Lespiriza cuniata presence. And you can see an example of this uh, map in, on this slide. The red pixels are regions with high probability of Lespiriza cuniata presence, and blue pixels are areas with low probability of Lespiriza cuniata presence. Now, something really important in remote sensing, uh, when we um, make a remote sensing uh, product, we need to assess the accuracy of our product. In order to tell the, land, uh, the, the end user how reliable our product is. And we did the same thing in our case with the uh, accuracy assessment. In other words, we assess the accuracy of our uh, classification product. And uh, for this accuracy assessment, we considered two scenarios. The first scenario was when a Lespiriza cuniata um, formed large uh, and homogeneous patches, like the one you see on the slide. In this case, our uh, approach performed really well. Uh, the accuracy was 94%. But something really important um, here is that um, invasive plants do not necessarily um, happen at large uh, patches. Uh, they can also form uh, sparse and small patches mixed with native plants, um, especially during the early stages of establishment. So um, in order to do this, um, we went to the field, we um, surveyed a large number of points, we documented uh, the abundance of Lespiriza cuniata, and then compared our results um, with remote sensing results. So our analysis showed that there was a strong agreement between remote sensing results and field-based uh, results. However, what we found uh, um, uh, was that um, our approach overestimated uh, Lespiriza cuniata presence in some cases, uh, which is presumably because of the um, mismatch between the size of the plants and the spatial resolution of our remotely sensed data. So these results were really uh, promising, were really um, um, exciting. But the important question is, what can we do with these um, um, remote sensing products? One of the um, most um, exciting um, applications of these remote sensing products is improving and enhancing decision-making activities. A great example is uh, using remote sensing to identify and improve management practices uh, to control the spread of invasive plants. Landowners use different management practices to control uh, the spread of invasive plants. Um, some use fire, some uh, landowners use grazing, um, some use herbicide, some use mowing. Uh, it is not clear how effective the, these approaches are, uh, primarily because the success uh, of these approaches have been assessed at a small scale. So what we can do, we can use remote sensing and map the spread of invasive species across large spatial domains and then identify which of these management practices are more effective at controlling the spread of invasive plants. I want to uh, take a, a minute or two to talk about data availability considerations. I think it is an important topic um, if we want to do um, remote sensing of invasive plants. So what we used in this uh, project was hyperspectral data collected from an aircraft. 
Well, the problem is that airborne campaigns are very costly and they also have limited spatial coverage, uh, meaning that uh, they do not cover large areas. And they also have coarse temporal resolution, uh, meaning that we cannot repeat airborne campaigns uh, several times uh, during the growing season, primarily because of the cost. So the limited availability of airborne hyperspectral data is an issue. But the good news is that uh, there are uh, sp space-borne hyperspectral data. We, uh, at the moment, we have a few uh, operational space-borne hyperspectral imagers in orbit. For example, NASA's EMIT is one of these uh, sensors which collect data with near global coverage, which is great. Uh, there is, um, however, one limitation, and that limitation is the uh, coarse spatial resolution of these uh, space-borne hyperspectral data. Usually the pixel size of these um, imagers is about 30 to um, 60 meters, which might be considered coarse um, for ecosystems like grasslands. And here is one example. On the top right, you can see um, our study area um, imaged using a uh, space-borne hyperspectral um, sensor. The resolution here is 30 meters. And on the, at the bottom left, you can see the same area, but uh, this time we collected data using an aircraft. In this case, the pixel size uh, was one meter. And you can see how much detail uh, we lose as um, uh, we coarsen the spatial resolution. But the good news is that in remote sensing, there are some techniques uh, we can use to resolve these limitations. Um, a a um, great technique is um, image fusion. What does it mean? Um, so image fusion um, in remote sensing is a type of a technique uh, that can be used to combine data from uh, different sensors. For example, in our case, uh, we can uh, combine um, multispectral data with fine um, spatial resolution, with hyperspectral data, with coarse spatial resolution, and generate a new data set which has a uh, fine uh, spectral and spatial resolution. Uh, this is um, a topic um, we are working on and we have uh, gotten some really interesting and promising results. And now I'm going to uh, do a quick summary of uh, what we learned um, and what we uh, went through in this uh, presentation. So in this talk, uh, we discuss the um, unique role of remote sensing to map invasive plants. And we learned that unlike field-based techniques, which um, are costly, time-consuming, and limited in their spatial coverage, uh, remote sensing can help us collect data uh, across large spatial domains over time with consistent format. But of course, there are um, some limitations. Um, one of the biggest limitations is the scale mismatch, uh, meaning that uh, the spatial resolution of our remotely sensed data um, often do not match the size of invasive plants in grassland ecosystems. Another limitation uh, is data availability. Uh, for example, um, we use airborne hyperspectral data, uh, but um, airborne hyperspectral data is not um, always um, um, available um, to research um, teams and research groups. But overall, the results um, were really uh, promising. And uh, what we can do, we can use all these um, exciting products from remote sensing of invasive plants and use them to um, enhance decision-making activities. One example that we discussed was um, using remote sensing to um, identify effective management practices to control the spread of invasive plants. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, stop here. I wanted to thank you for listening. And now I handed this to Sativa. Thank you so much, Hamed, for your presentation. We are grateful for your time and expertise. And thank you to everyone has who has joined us for all three parts of this series. To summarize, in this series, we covered a broad overview of remote sensing of invasive species. Part one was our introduction to remote sensing of invasives, and we were able to highlight NASA develop examples, as well as other examples in the literature. We also shared about available data and tools. 
Part two focused on the remote sensing of invasive aquatic plant species. And as Hamed just covered, we dived into a little bit more about invasive grassland species. And with that, I will provide the summary of our training. So overall, we introduced the extent and impacts of invasive species on biodiversity and a changing climate. We established that remote sensing can be used to map and monitor invasive species. We also identified different types of remote sensing data and products. We described the key considerations, benefits, and limitations of remote sensing of invasive species. And as I just mentioned, reviewed in greater detail remote sensing and field methods used to monitor aquatic and grassland invasive plant species. As a final reminder, to receive credit for participation, please complete the homework assignment by September 11th. It will be posted to the training webpage today as a Google form. You can expect to receive your certificate about two months after this course. If you have any additional questions following our time together, please feel free to reach out. Our contact information, as well as links to our website, social media, YouTube channel, and sister programs can be found here. We will now move into our Q&A portion. So thank you so much again for being here and we'll go ahead and start going through the questions. Um, so let's get started. The first question we had was, how does hyperspectral remote sensing differentiate between native and invasive species in grassland ecosystems? So effective mapping of invasive plants depends on several factors. For example, contrasting seasonal phenology of invasive plants compared to native plants, or distinct biochemical, physiological, and structural characteristics or functional traits of invasive plants versus native plants. The strength of hyperspectral data is their fine spectral resolution. So that means that these data can be distinguished by minute, by minute spectral differences in native and invasive species. So if we have invasive species with different functional traits compared to those of native species, we can detect them using suitable hyperspectral data. Eventually, successful application of remote sensing data, regardless of data type, depends on the spatial resolution of remotely sensed data compared to the size of the phenomenon we are observing. This issue was also discussed in part two of the webinar. Please also see the answer to question seven, which we will get to in just a bit. All right, so moving on to question two. Someone asked, can hyperspectral remote sensing detect early stage invasions before they become widespread? If so, how? Well, this primarily depends on whether the spatial resolution, so also the grain size or the pixel size, matches the phenomenon we're observing. If we're dealing with large invasive plants compared to the scale of remote sensing observation, then the likelihood of successful mapping is gonna be higher. If we are dealing with small individuals similar to those in grasslands, then we will need fine resolution hyperspectral data for early detection. To do early stage detection, there are many options. One is classification, which was also covered in part two, or you can use trait-based approaches similar to what was discussed in this webinar. Okay, question three. I have a question referring to the previous part, part two, specifically about the spectral angle mapper technique. I wonder how to assess the, the angle, that the angle between the curve in a pixel and the reference curve defines that the mapped material or substance is present in a given pixel. Is there an optimal way to determine the cutoff threshold for the angle value? So the threshold is user defined. There is a paper um, going to be linked in this document by Dennison, Halligan, and Roberts. It's an early paper, um, and it will provide a nice overview of the error metrics and constraints for the spectral angle mapper and spectral mixture analysis techniques that were introduced in part two. 
Optimizing these error metrics is how most people identify the optimal threshold. So refer back to that paper. Question four, can we detect invasive plants using Sentinel-2 images? Yes, potentially. So this depends on the invasive plant uh, in question, primarily its prevalence, its size, and phenology. Refer back to the questions one and two that we had just covered. Question five, how does one create a spectral graph per pixel from a multispectral drone image? Well, a drone-based multispectral data is similar to those we get from Landsat, Sentinel-2, et cetera. After processing the data, so that is the geometric, radiometric correction, and atmospheric correction, we can extract spectral graphs per pixel from drone data using pack packages such as Python, R, MATLAB, or software packages like ENVI or, or ERDAS. Question six, is there a global equivalent for maps? Yes, so there, there are. Um, one example is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, and that link will also be made available in this document. Question seven. Hogan grass, Imperata cylindrical, is an invasive that grows along highways, radiating away from port facilities. It grows in right of ways, then adjacent to fields. Fields. How big of a patch is necessary to appear in a remote sensing image? By the time it is large enough to be found on an image, it is difficult to eradicate. Can remote sensing be used here? So the minimum mapping unit or MMU should ideally dictate the appropriate spatial resolution for a given application. The MMU represents the smallest feature size that can be detected on a map. Features smaller than the MMU will not be represented. The specific MMU will vary depending on the application of management objectives. Once it's established, the spatial resolution of remote sensing imagery should ideally be finer than the MMU. Although explicit guidelines are often lacking in the literature. In practice, however, the choice of spatial resolution is frequently influenced by the availability and cost of data, as well as trade-offs with temporal and spectral resolution. With coarser resolution data, the mixed pixel problem is an issue. Techniques like soft or fuzzy classification methods are commonly employed to handle this issue, where each pixel is assigned varying degrees of membership across multiple classes. A prominent approach is something called spectral mixture analysis, which models the spectra of each pixel as a linear combination of pure spectra from different landscape components. So, and members like their soil, water, vegetation. This allows for the mapping of each pixel as a fraction of different end members. This topic was explored in detail in part two. Next question, how would one create a spectral signature for a specific plant from drone multispectral imagery? So after pre-processing the data, we can extract signatures for specific plants from drone data using packages such as Python R or MATLAB, um, as well as uh, software packages like MV or ERDAS. This was also um, addressed in question five. Question nine. How effectively can the maximum entropy algorithm be applied to this use case. So that max uh, entropy is a species distribution model. Our 
our focus of this talk was on direct mapping of invasive plants, but we can use maximum entropy and other species distribution models to model the spatial distribution of invasive plants. To develop an SM SDM, we will need additional environmental variables. Question 10, what hyperspectral imager did you use? So um, in this study, they collected airborne hyperspectral data, A AISI, Fenix, one kilometer, Spisum, Olu, in Finland. Um, yeah, that information's there. <laughs> the data covered the 400 to 2,450 nanometer range in 323 spectral bands, and it had a resolution of approximately 4.5 nanometers in the 400 to 970 nanometer range and 14 nanometers in the 9. 170 to 2450 nanometer range. Okay, the next question is how do you assess accuracy? So we can use measures called classification accuracy assessment as discussed in slide 35. The most reliable approach to conduct accuracy assessment is using field based data and then comparing them to remote sensing classification results. Question 12 Which model is used to determine nitrogen content in L. Um, Aniata? What were the model's inputs and function for determining the nitrogen content in the field? An example of such a case would be helpful. So we use a data, um, the researchers used a data-driven model called partial least squares. Independent variables are spectral reflectance data and dependent variables are foliar nitrogen content. And we quantified from foliage samples that they collected in the field. Next question is emit open source. How do we access the data? Does it need Python code, etc.? So yes, uh, emit is open source, and you can check out the following links um, to get more information about emit. So please refer back to this Q&A um, page once it is posted. Question 14. I guess the functional traits vary temporally over the growing season. Did you take that into account when mapping these traits? How does this affect the classification? So yes, this is a great point. They do vary in time. To minimize the impact of temporal variability of traits, um, the team collected remotely sensed data and field data as close as possible and within a few days. But the temporal mismatch between remotely sensed data and field data is a source of uncertainty. Next question, could you explain a little bit about the technique of image fusion to improve resolution? Is it pan sharpening? in another language. So there are many methods for image infusion. In this case, they used a method called hyperspectral image super resolution or HiSure. HiSure is a subpaced method that extracts end member information from the coarse spatial resolution hyperspectral data and estimates the abundance fractions of the end members from the fine spatial resolution multispectral data. This was conducted in MATLAB. Next question. What are the main 
challenges in applying hyperspectral remote sensing for invasive species monitoring in grasslands. Yeah, so some of the challenges are data availability, pre-processing that's needed, particularly atmospheric correction, and the large data volume. It's also preferred to collect field observations to develop models and validate them. So another challenge is collecting field data in remote locations. All right. We're going to go to the next question. Yeah, thank you all. We have um, quite a few here coming in, so we appreciate uh, your patience as we uh, work as a team to, to get these uh, sort of drafted. Okay, so question 17. I would like to ask what the process of resampling data up to three meters look like. Was it traditional, like bilinear, or perhaps another algorithm or machine learning method that was used? So this is a great question. Um, they fuse data from DESIS with those from Planet using image fusion. Um, refer back to question 15 for more information. Question 18, is there a repository where we can be able to access the indices for common invasive species or one has to craft them individually or refer to available journals? So there are open source repositories for invasive species um, such as EDMAP and um, I believe this is GBIF, which was referenced earlier in the um, Q&A document. Wonderful. Okay, so we have a few more questions here and we'll see if we can um, maybe get some response from our experts on the line um, if if they are available to answer um, with their with their voice um, if if not we will be sure to spend some time filling out the rest of the responses for these questions so can i will you, can you hear me Sadipa? okay I can hear you just fine Hamed how Perfect. are you I'm doing great hello everyone um this is Hamed um, so I'm going to try to answer the questions um, um, through uh, this chat. Um, so how does the team see the future of invasive species mapping with the launch of uh, Landsat Next? That's a great question. Um, Landsat Next uh, will be um, an, an improved version of Landsat 8 and 9. It will have a spatial resolution of 10 to 20 meters and also um, finer spectral resolution. So we expect that at the launch of Lancet uh, next, we will have um, more capability to map uh, invasive species. Of course, as was uh, discussed earlier, it will depend on the, the invasive species in question, um, uh, primarily uh, the, 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 the difference between the uh, pixel size or spatial resolution of our remote sensitive and the phenomena we are observing on the ground. Um, question um, 21, can you please explain more on how to find traits that can distinguish a particular weed uh, from the rest of the plants? Is it possible to have a singular trait uh, with which um, can distinguish multiple weeds that are more? If yes, how can I find those traits? Um, it's another great question. Um, so when, when um, we uh, started this project um, a few years ago, um, we started with um, reading about this invasive plant from the species of Cuniata, learning about it, and uh, finding out what makes this invasive plant successful. Uh, specifically, what are the specific characteristics that help this invasive plant uh, spread in grassland um, ecosystems? And we found that um, um, the, the, um, some of the traits that help this invasive plant uh, spread is uh, high nitrogen content compared to native plants, uh, uh, being taller than uh, native plants, um, um, also being allotropic, which we release specific chemicals on the soil. Uh, they also have high tannin content um, compared to native plants. 
Now, the thing is that the list of these trees are really long. Some of these trees are not remotely observable. We can only estimate some of these traits uh, from remotely sensed data. So we focus on those traits that we were able to um, remotely estimate based on previous literature. And then uh, we collected um, uh, voltage samples in the field and sent them to the lab and developed our model based on these traits. Uh, so to answer the question, it depends on the, the, the invasive plant that you have in hand and, and what traits uh, distinguish this um, invasive plant from native plants. And if you can identify those traits, and there is a chance that we can um, estimate some of the, those traits um, using remotely sensed data. Um, can we combine question 22? Um, can we combine uh, multiple traits for distinguishing multiple weeds? Um, yes, um, it's another great question. So what we did in our project, for example, we used uh, several traits. Uh, we uh, selected a long list of traits, uh, 10 or 12 of them, and eventually we selected um, six, of, six of them. Uh, so we collectively used these six traits to uh, distinguish our invasive plant from native plants. So you can use multiple traits to distinguish uh, invasive plants from native plants. And if you're lucky, if you're dealing with uh, uh, invasive uh, uh, plants or invasive uh, weeds uh, that have uh, you know, similar um, characteristics that distinguish them from native plants, then yeah, yes, you can use uh, the combination of those traits uh, to distinguish, uh, to distinguish uh, those um, invasive weeds from native plants. All right. Question 23, would machine learning with accuracy tuning using proxy data sets and those from indices such as NDVI, WQI, uh, be possible to enhance the effectiveness of invasive plant detection? Yes, this is another great question. As a follow-up uh, to our um, uh, project where we use uh, my perspective remotely sensed data, uh, we um, developed um, other projects and specifically one goal we had was how can we develop um, a more affordable, cost-effective approaches to detect invasive plants? So we use hyperspectral data in our uh, project, in the project that we just uh, heard about. But hyperspectral data, uh, especially if you're collecting them from an aircraft or a drone, are very expensive, and they are um, costly to process. So our goal was, uh, let's um, um, develop uh, something easier, um, cheaper, and um, we decided to use multi-spectral data. Um, uh, specifically, we use Planet Scope, uh, which provide data with spatial resolution of three meters. But these are multi-spectral data. Uh, they have a um, limited number of bands. Uh, so what we did, instead of using traits, um, we used uh, vegetation indices that are good proxies of these traits that we identified based on our field data. So we know, for example, uh, this trait, uh, this vegetation index is a good uh, proxy of nitrogen. We know that the other vegetation index is a good proxy of, let's say, chlorophyll. So we selected those um, vegetation indices and then used them uh, to develop uh, models uh, to map uh, invasive uh, plants. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes, uh, there is potential there, uh, especially if you do not have uh, access to uh, hyperspectral um, data, we can use multi-spectral data and use vegetation indices uh, to map invasive plants. However, the choice, there should be some reasoning, some justification behind using those vegetation indices. Uh, can you explain more about the data fusion process, uh, planet uh, basis, um, image fusion, or lake resources where uh, we can learn more? Yes, uh, we um, answer this question specifically uh, in question 15. So um, if you can uh, take a look at uh, our answer to question number 15, hopefully it will to provide some answers for you. And there are many um, image fusion techniques. Um, there are several of them. And what we used was something called hyperspectral image super resolution. And uh, the input for uh, these type of fusion techniques is uh, often a high, a high resolution or fine resolution data. And uh, with, in other words, uh, remotely sensed data with fine uh, spatial resolution. And another remotely sensed data which has uh, coarser spatial resolution, in this case, uh, space borne hyperspectral data. And then um, you need to do some tuning. Uh, these approaches require um, some uh, tuning. 
Um, and then after that, you will get your fuse data. And then finally, you need to do um, quality um, assessment to see if your fuse data is, um, uh, is reliable and, and satisfactory. Uh, but we can, um, um, I will make sure to add um, a few uh, papers and uh, references uh, for you. Question 25, if uh, using drone imagery flown at 30 meters, is it still necessary to do pre-processing such as atmospheric correction, et cetera? Um, yes. Um, so um, depends, uh, it also depends on what type of sensor you're putting on uh, your drone. If you are putting a hyperspectral sensor on your drone, then you will definitely need to do um, radiometric and atmospheric correction, and of course, geometric correction. If you are using hyperspectral uh, data, um, multi-spectral sensor on your drone, um, also yes. Um, often, um, how uh, we do this, we put a um, target, a calibration target, um, on the ground. Uh, with known reflectance, or we measure its reflectance in the field, and afterwards we will calibrate our I perspective uh, um, our uh, remotely sensed uh, data um, and convert into uh, reflectance. In other words, we will try to minimize the impact of atmospheric um, effects on our uh, data. Um, and that being said, uh, sometimes people um, use um, um, multi-spectral data without, uh, from drones without pre-processing, uh, but personally, um, I, I don't um, recommend doing that. Um, question 26, what part of the presentation was the ecological events that um, helped distinguish between species covered? Um, so in this uh, talk, uh, we um, focused on trait-based mapping. We focused at one point in time. Um, in other words, we didn't use uh, uh, phenology uh, to do our uh, mapping. And uh, the, the reason for it, there were several reasons for that. Uh, the, the, the first reason was that we didn't have access to um, remotely sensed data with fine temporal and uh, uh, spatial resolution. Um, so we went with data with fine spectral and spatial resolution. But that being said, you can definitely use um, um, remotely sensed data with fine temporal resolution to map um, invasive plants. And that's um, uh, one of the projects that uh, we have been working on, and we have. Uh, uh, published a few papers on that where we use multi-spectral data from planet um, to see where we can, uh, when we can uh, map invasive species uh, during the growing season. But in this talk, in the specific uh, presentation, we focus uh, on one point in time using hyperspectral data. Um, are there any free hyperspectral data sources? Um, um, I assume my colleague, Dr. Aaron Hester, um, answered this question. I really appreciate that. Yes, there are uh, many um, free hyperspectral data sources. Um, there is, uh, uh, there is of course, EMIT. It is a space-borne hyperspectral data. It provides data from 400 to 2,500 nanometers uh, with a special resolution of 60 meters. Um, so we also have uh, DASIS data, uh, which is a sensor mounted on International Space Station. Um, it also has a spatial resolution of 30 meters, but it is, doesn't provide, um, um, it provides a limited um, hyperspectral data compared to uh, EMIT. Uh, there is also Averis and Averis NG. These are NASA sensors. Um, um, these are specifically airborne hyperspectral um, data. And um, you can, um, you know, there are um, data portals uh, where you can freely download um, Averis and Averis NG. Uh, airborne data. So there are several options. You have spaceborne hyperspectral data like EMIT. Um, um, also, PACE will be another um, good option, but they, they often have a coarse uh, spec uh, spatial resolution. There are also airborne hyperspectral data that you can use, like Avaris or Avaris NG. And both of them are really available. Are there question 28? Are there any com uh, computational imaging techniques that allow us to get data from multi spectral drones that would be competitive enough with hyperspectral imagery to detect invasive um, species? Uh, I am not sure if I fully understand um, uh, this question. So, um, 
Yeah, if we have a multi spectral sensor on, on a drone, uh, the advantage we have is that uh, the data will be the volume of data would be um, way uh, smaller compared to hyperspectral data. Also, with multi spectral uh, drones, um, you can fly at uh, low altitudes and uh, collect data with really fine spatial resolution or pixel size or frame size. And as we discussed uh, today, if you have data with really fine spatial resolution, then the the odd that the likelihood of uh, detecting invasive uh, plants will be much higher. But uh, in terms of a spectral resolution, um, 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 multi-spectral sensors have a, a much um, fewer spectral bands and therefore coarser uh, spectral resolution compared to uh, hyperspectral data. Uh, but to answer your question um, and in a sentence, yes, we can use uh, multi-spectral data from drones um, to map and detect invasive species because they provide data with really fine uh, spatial resolution, which would help us um, to map invasive species um, more reliably. Uh, with a, a question 29, uh, with, for example, 320 bands, how do we go about choosing the correct ones? What composites are useful? Um, so this is a great question. Um, so 320 bands refers to the number of the spectral bands that we have in, in a hyperspectral um, data set. And the question is asking, are we selecting the specific bands? And if so, how? Um, no, we are using all spectral bands. The only exception is we are removing water vapor absorption bands. These are the bands that are affected by atmospheric water vapor. We remove them because uh, they are often noisy and not uh, reliable. But after this, um, removing these um, unreliable or bad uh, bands, we use all these bands in our um, data-driven model, um, in our case, PLSR. So what we did, uh, we pre-processed our remote distance data, we removed unnecessary bands, the ones that have been impacted by water vapor. And then afterwards, um, we use PLSR we um, use uh, spectral bands or reflectance as the input, as the independent variables, and our um, traits that we measured in the field as our uh, dependent variables and develop our models. Um, I just want to mention that PLSR is one example of a data-driven model. There are many other uh, machine learning approaches that um, you can use instead of PLSR um, to um, do what we did. But to answer this question, we use all the bands, except those bands that have been affected by the atmosphere. Question 30, how is the CCV gamma handle here? Is it the differentiate over different oceans and land or temple uh, spectrography fixing or the actual thing? Um, I um, I don't have a clear answer to um, this question, um, unfortunately. Um, question 31, do um, hyperspectral images help with uh, ENA identification? Also, um, what are the best methods and instruments for biochemical sampling? How can I get technology for classifying of any other species? Um, Yes, hyperspectral data potentially can help us with mapping uh, different species. Again, it depends on several factors that we discussed earlier during this Q&A. And uh, methodology for uh, classifying um, El Cuniata species, uh, we have um, detailed and uh, we have provided details on our methodology um, in the papers that we have published, and I will make sure to provide uh, the links for these papers um, after the talk. Question number 32, what are the most effective spectral bands or indices for differentiating ISPVs from native grassland uh, species? Um, it is another great question. We uh, partly partially covered it in um, question number 29, I think. Um, so, all the spectral bands can potentially help us um, to differentiate uh, invasive plants from uh, native plants. Uh, but it also depends if you are, for example, following uh, um, an approach uh, similar to ours based on traits based mapping. Um, specific traits affect uh, specific uh, spectral bands. So, although we use all the spectral bands in our analysis, 
there are specific bands that are more important than others in um, uh, identifying or mapping invasive plants uh, and distinguishing them from uh, native uh, plants. Question 33, uh, did you use points or polygons for accuracy assessment? What are your thoughts on the controversy uh, of using overall accuracy metric? Uh, it's another good question. Uh, we um, basically used um, two different approaches to do uh, classification accuracy assessment. The first scenario was when uh, an invasive plant or Lespedeza cuneata uh, is the common uh, uh, species. In other words, when it uh, uh, forms uh, homogeneous and large patches. And uh, in order to do that, uh, basically uh, use the high accuracy GPS in the field and map uh, where this invasive plant is. Basically, we map the polygon and we overlay that uh, with our um, remote distance data and did an accuracy assessment. Um, but then this is not the case all the time in the real world. When you are dealing with invasive um, plants, there are cases where this invasive plant can be um, can form sparse and small patches of um, uh, small patches. Uh, and uh, to 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 address this, to, to test the accuracy of our model in situations like this, uh, we also visited a large number of data points, uh, several hundreds of uh, small plots. Um, um, 10 meter by 10 meter um, plot, and we um, documented the abundance of um, invasive uh, species in uh, our study site. And then we um, compared that estimated abundance in the field with the estimated abundance from our remotely uh, sensed data um, to see how reliable our models are. Um, question 34, um, can you explain the type of challenges that arise when detecting invasive species in their heterogeneous grass environments using hyperspectral data. Um, we, we partly covered this um, question earlier, but uh, uh, the main challenges from a remote sensing perspective, if we are using hyperspectral data, is data availability, uh, pre-processing, which is extremely important um, in uh, when you're using hyperspectral data, and also uh, the volume of uh, the data. If you're using with hyper, if you're using hyperspectral data, uh, especially fine resolution hyperspectral data, the data volume is pretty high. Um, also, um, in the field, uh, we, we have a lot of challenges. It's um, often uh, remote places we need to collect data, and remote places if you um, you, if you want to measure specific traits like uh, chlorophyll, for example, you need to um, uh, flash freeze your samples in the field. So you need to have liquid nitrogen, dry ice, and all of that in the field with you. So there are many, uh, many challenges uh, there. Um, so it, it, it is, uh, it, it's been a quite uh, learning uh, process for all of us doing uh, projects like this. Um, Question 35, um, do we need require image fusion if you have multi spectral sensor drone imagery if you have hot scale to medium resolution sentinel data? Um, um, if you have fine resolution um, uh, multi spectral data and if you want to plan um, um, map invasive plants, then you can directly use your drone data. Um, uh, probably you don't need to fuse it with um, sentinel data. Um, so multi-spectral sensor on drones usually have uh, several spectral bands. Um, so they have uh, uh, seven, um, eight, nine, 11, 12, many spectral bands. So I would recommend using uh, drone data directly without using it with uh, Sentinel data. Um, um, if you wanna uh, use it for mapping um, invasive uh, plants. Uh, the reason we fuse planets and bases uh, in our project uh, was that um, the basis has fine spectral resolution. It is hyperspectral, but its spatial resolution is coarse. It is about 30 meters, which is really coarse for our uh, for our um, uh, work uh, mapping invasive plants in uh, grasslands. And as a result of that, we decided to fuse uh, this data, these uh, basis data, with planet scope data, which have finer spectral resolution, spatial resolution. And at the end, we had a fuse data set with fine spectral and uh, spatial resolution. I hope my answer uh, made um, sense. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for um, taking the time to add additional uh, information there. Your expertise is much appreciated and everybody else working behind the scenes, thank you all for making this webinar possible.
And thank you participants for being here and your interest in the topic. Um, as mentioned, uh, homework is due on September 11th. Please get that in and we will post this Q and A uh, in about a week. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. We hope you all have a fabulous day.